In the West Australian outback, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder Telescope is about to embark on a massive project to map the southern skies in radio waves. This survey will create an evolutionary map of the universe, helping us understand how the first stars and galaxies formed and how they evolved to become what we see today. The project involves over 400 researchers from around the world, and it's being led by Australian astronomers. I spoke to Dr. Michael Cowley from the Queensland University of Technology, who heads the Redshift Working Group of the EMU project. So Michael, tell me about the EMU project. What kinds of objects will it see and what kind of map is it aiming to create? Yeah, so EMU stands for the Evolutionary Map of the Universe, which is a, a new generation radio survey that's being conducted with the Australia Square Kilometre Array or the ASCAP. And look, there's a ton of science goals. Um, in addition to providing like a, a, a Google Maps of the radio sky, uh, it, it aims to uh, map probably around about 40 million or so galaxies, which will allow us to do some cool science, such as the evolution of galaxies, uh, the role of active supermassive black holes, the history of star formation, and, and really the list goes on. So there's just tons of science that's going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at radio sources, is that right? That's Why are we both. looking at radio sources rather than optical objects that we can see? So when it comes to uh, the radio emission, nearly all astronomical objects emit radio waves, but uh, some of the most prominent, I guess, are things like pulsars, nebulae, those active supermassive black holes that I mentioned before. But uh, in addition to those and finding radio galaxies, there's a lot of exotic or unknown objects. Um, uh, some examples include the short-lived fast radio bursts or FRBs, which are relatively uh, new to astronomers. Uh, and even more new uh, is the odd radio circles or ORCs, uh, ORCs, uh, which again, uh, what's generating uh, that radio emission is relatively unknown to us, uh, but it's, it's something that we're keen to observe and understand as part of the EMU survey. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that a lot of radio sources, like, I mean, some must be a lot brighter than others. Um, is EMU aiming to detect ones that are perhaps a bit fainter and haven't been seen before as well? Yeah, the, there certainly is an effort to try and find faint objects or more distant objects. Um, but I think the motivation behind EMU is primarily related to ASCAP and its ability to rapidly survey um, over a wide field of view or, or simply put the ASCAP's going to allow EMU to detect hundreds of times more galaxies than current radio telescopes around the world. So that's where we see most of the benefit from EMU. Mm -hmm. So these objects that EMU is going to be looking at, how old are they going to be and how far away are they going to be? Yeah, great question. Uh, obviously, uh, like I said before, radio emission comes from all types of objects. It comes from our sun, uh, which is obviously very nearby, uh, the nearest stars, which are only light years away, uh, our nearby galaxies uh, like Andromeda, which is 2.5 million light years away, but then also distant galaxies. Some of the earliest uh, known galaxies, which are, uh, were born essentially around about a billion years after the Big Bang. So their light has traveled 12 billion light years on its um, uh, trip to us. So the idea with um, uh, this catalog of radio emission or radio galaxies that we're putting together is it's going to span a large chunk of cosmic time. Mm -hmm. And throughout that, are you going to see how stars and galaxies first formed and how they changed? Yeah, for sure. Uh, understanding the formation and evolution of galaxies is a key science um, goal, but also uh, things such as cosmic star formation history and understanding uh, how stars were formed and how they contribute to the buildup of galaxies over time as well. So yeah, for sure, that will play a big part of our science goals. And understanding how stars and galaxies formed, why is that so interesting and, and exciting to find out? Uh, it's, I guess it's part of that fundamental science, the, the exploring the unknown and understanding, but I guess also uh, understanding things like uh, how stars uh, are born, how they form, how they live and how they die allows us to place it into context of our own sun. 
We want to understand how our sun was formed, uh, how long it's going to live, when it will ultimately die, but also understanding the fundamental science that comes out of it as well, and if it's maybe applicable to us here on Earth. So there's just so much science that comes out of astronomy and astrophysics that it's so broad. It's not just about the unknown, which is certainly what interests me in looking for it, but there are applicable um, uh, applications, I guess you could say, from astronomy and astrophysics um, you know, to our very way of life here on Earth too. Yeah. Now you're heading up the Redshift working group of the EMI project. What exactly is Redshift and why is it important to know about? Yeah, so specifically, uh, we're looking at something known as the cosmological redshift of these objects that we're observing in EMU. Um, I guess it's, it's thanks to Edwin Hubble that we know about the universe is expanding and this expansion essentially stretches light that travels through space. So the light that's leaving one of those distant galaxies, um, uh, when it left there on its journey to us here at Earth, it's been stretched. And so it's perhaps been shifted from the visible part of the spectrum uh, into something like the infrared. And so when you take that into consideration, the longer that the light has traveled, the more that it's been redshifted or shifted into the redder part of the spectrum. Now, measuring the shift is analogous to measuring the distance to an object. And so due to the finite speed of light, any astronomical object we look at means we're seeing it how it appeared in the past. Uh, I used the sun as an example before. Eight, um, as we look at it now, it's eight minutes ago. Uh, the nearest stars, um, I mentioned we're only light years away. So that means uh, we're seeing them how they looked just years ago. The Andromeda galaxy, 2.5 million light years away. So we're seeing how it looked 2.5 million years ago. And those distant galaxies, 12 billion light years away, or how they appeared 12 billion years ago. And so our group is um, keen on working out where the redshift is for those particular objects so we can put them into the context of well, when did we observe them? Well, when did they exist through cosmic time at that point when we looked at them, which allows us to do things like evolutionary studies of perhaps galaxies forming and evolving through cosmic time or the star formation that we talked about. Okay. So if an object is 12 or 13 billion light years away, that means that it was around 12 or 13 billion years ago. So we're seeing it like at the very beginning of the universe. Exactly. Uh, so uh, we've got the ability to peer back to almost the first galaxies, uh, only around about a billion years after the Big Bang. And it will be thanks to new generation telescopes that like the James Webb Space Telescope or the JWST that will allow us to peer back even further um, uh, to see how the first galaxies really started to form. But at the moment, uh, thanks to uh, multi-wavelength observatories that we have, in addition to the ASCAP, we're able to peer back to almost the first galaxies at a very early period of time in the universe's creations, for sure. Yeah, that must be a very cool thing to work on. <laughs> It's cool being able to see, uh, I guess, the history or the family tree of galaxies, uh, as I like to put it, seeing um, baby galaxies build up over time. Uh, an interesting uh, study that I've performed is looking at the um, Milky Way analogs, seeing what uh, the Milky, how the Milky Way may have been built up over cosmic time and looking for analogs in the past of what the Milky Way may have looked like when it was a bit of a baby kind of galaxy. And so that allows us to build up and create this family tree or uh, I guess this evolutionary path that the Milky Way may have taken. And then also ultimately where it may be going in the future as well. Yeah, that's cool. So with your work in the redshift group, how are you actually going to determine redshift? Like how do you figure out how far away something is? Yes. Yeah, so when it comes to uh, redshift, what we're looking at is that shifting of the light. And so different processes within a galaxy give off um, different amounts of light. We've got the gas in the galaxy, we've got the stars in the galaxies, and even things like the supermassive black hole can emit its own light in the galaxy. Um, and we look for unique signatures within that light. Uh, and we see how much it's been shifted in the spectrum, which allows us to determine uh, basically its distance. Now, the trouble with uh, this activity though is there's millions of sources and so traditionally when we've done this redshift activity we uh, the last catalog uh, just to give the comparison um, I worked on was around about 70,000 galaxies and it's something that took us a, a good chunk of time perhaps months to put together a really robust redshift catalog of these 70,000 sources but now we've got this new effort of doing it on a scale that has not been seen before millions of galaxies so it's going to take a lot of effort which is why we've got a big team together to do it.
Mm -hmm. And I saw that you're going to be using maybe machine learning techniques as well. Is that becoming more of a thing in astronomy since you have so much data now? Yeah, it's really cool. Combining one of the newest fields of science, machine learning, with uh, the oldest astronomy. And, and it's thanks to these advancements in technology that we've just got too much data, too much analysis. So we need new techniques to tackle it. And so machine learning comes into play. And I guess to put it in simple terms, we train our computers to do what we do or what our algorithms have done in the past, but it allows it um, to do it much more faster and also often with less bias associated with it as well, which is cool. Yeah. So when is the EMU survey going to start and when are you going to start getting data from it to work with? So there has been pilot surveys run at the moment to test it, uh, looking at smaller patches of the sky. And um, that data has been played around with, with the, the larger EMU team. And uh, they've produced some uh, journal articles uh, and papers from it already, which is fantastic. Uh, but the expectation is that we'll kick off uh, full operations um, sometime next year in 2022. And so that's when we have to make sure that uh, our efforts with regards to the Redshift group are ready for when uh, we have those millions of uh, galaxies start flowing on in. Yeah. And how long is it going to take to be able to find those, what did you say, 40 million galaxies or 40 <laughs> billion sources? Yeah, it's that's a that's a, a, a challenge in itself and something that uh, I'm not too sure on personally, but I think it could it could take years to be honest. And the expectation is that the EMU survey will run for a very long period of time. ASCAP is designed for to run for a very long period of time, so I expect years, perhaps even decades, will be taking in this data and analysing it. So uh, it's exciting times uh, to get so much new uh, data uh, there to analyse. And so uh, all of the students that um, I train myself, uh, hopefully I'll be able to pass on uh, the torch to them to pick up and take over as well. So not saying I'm too old, but, you know. <laughs> Is there anything that you're really excited to see out of this project? Like, are you hoping for EMU to see a particular type of astronomical object? Uh, well, obviously, I, I guess uh, those um, odd radio circles or orcs or the, the fast radio bursts and any kind of new uh, radio phenomena is always going to be very interesting and um, exciting to me. But my particular field of research is those supermassive black holes. And so um, I've used multi-wavelength studies in the past, uh, combining things such as optical data from the Hubble Space Telescope or infrared data from the Herschel Observatory and even radio data, limited radio data data from the very large array and uh, having access to uh, this massive amount of data that's going to flow in from ASCAP and the EMU survey is uh, going to provide such new insights into the uh, not only just supermassive black holes but how they influence galaxies over cosmic time as well so I'm really keen to understand uh, if they co-evolve happily together or if perhaps there's some kind of impact uh, that supermassive black holes have on a galaxy's ability to uh, grow and evolve as well. So that's what I'll be um, most excited for. So as soon as I wrap up my efforts with regards to the Redshift group, I'll be jumping over into the, the black hole science group. Cool. Nice. And do you know what's next for ASCAP? Is it going to be busy with EMU for the years to come or is it going to be doing some other cool stuff as well? Yeah, EMU is just one of the number of surveys uh, that has pitched ideas to ASCAP and there are others out there. And so um, obviously our focus is on a very um, large um, field um, of galaxies, but I know there'll be uh, other surveys that are perhaps more focused on specialised um, uh, astronomy and astrophysics. And so they'll be pitching their own ideas to ASCAP to take advantage of um, uh, the unique um, uh, technology that we have available to us out in Western Australia. So yeah, EMU is not it. Uh, keep an eye out for all the other surveys and all the other exciting science that we're flowing out of ASCAP. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for having to chat to me today. It was awesome to learn about what the EMU project is up with, up to. And uh, yeah, good luck with it. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>